Thank you so very much. Um, well, everyone in the room, government representatives, business leaders, our constituents, employers, trade unions, media, Economic Times representatives, uh, esteemed participants, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and namaskar to all of you. I would like to start to congratulate you all today for representing businesses and business models that break the recent years of pandemic, putting people first, and shape cultures that represent employee excellence. Now, since 2020, the world has realized the precarious conditions that most employment exists in, as people lost their jobs and didn't have adequate health coverage and social protection when dealing with the pandemic crisis. Moreover, as job digitalized, the labor market became harder to access for some, also exposing the skills gaps in the workforce, calling for upskilling and reskilling to adapt to the needs of a changing economy and labor market. This includes adaptation to the climate crisis, which is already affecting countries like India, urgently requesting far greater coordination to enable a just transition to an environmentally sustainable economy and prevent widespread devastation from occurring. But also we need to harness the opportunities to generate more green and sustainable jobs in the course of this adaptation. Businesses and industries, ladies and gentlemen, are therefore currently addressing crises of multiple fronts, I would say. At the same time, we see that in many countries and economic sectors, there is a shortage of workforce and a great difficulty to find and attract qualified talent, let alone to retain it. What some call the great resignation saw so employees and workers drop out of the labor force and turn to other careers, new ventures during the pandemic. To be a successful enterprise today definitely requires focusing on employee well-being and also development to keep them engaged and collectively strive for excellence. Part of this is to bring a, a broad and diverse workforce. And I wish to mention one important element here, and that is to do away with discrimination and harassment in the world of work. The ratification of the International Labour Standard on Violence and Harassment, the ILO Convention 190, would go a long way in this regard. And you may wish to advo advocate for this. Now, already before the pandemic, ladies and gentlemen, there was a global consensus that the high levels of inequality between nations and within countries, as well as between men and women, have adverse social, economic, and political consequences. The pandemic exacerbated inequality and job losses, and you can read in the latest ILO projection forecasting a deficit in hours worked globally, which is equ equivalent to 52 million full-time jobs, according to the ILO's World Employment and Social Outlook 2022 Trends Report. As economic and social transformations continue, countries, regardless of the stage of development, must answer this one fundamental question. What will be the jobs of the future and what competences will they demand? Globally, there is a persistent gap between the skills needed in the labor market and those offered by the workforce. This places an urgent demand on individuals, on companies and countries to acquire new skills, reskill and upskill to adapt to the new normal and also to the be future ready, especially in the face of digital transformation. Skills development and lifelong learning are fundamental enablers of decent work, productivity, sustainability that can raise the value of output of labor 
empowers the lives of people and enriched societies. Now, in 1920, uh, 19, sorry, in 2019, I should rather say, the ILO constituents, and that is actually government, employers, and workers together, adopted the Centenary Declaration for the Future of Work with a human-centered approach, and it focuses on three types of investments. In, in, in three, to increase investments in people's capabilities, increase investments in institutions of work, and increase investment in decent and sustainable work for sustainable economic growth. Now, since 2020, uh, the UN has, the United Nations, has resolutely pushed for building forward better in line with the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals and the ILO's 2021 Global Call to Action for Human Centered Recovery from COVID 19 Crisis that is inclusive, sustainable, and re resilient affirms this. Ladies and gentlemen, we must realize that the pandemic has hurt young workers the most. Young people were less likely to be in more senior roles in their organizations and hence more likely to lose their jobs. According to ILO's very recent Global Youth Employment Trends Report, the total global number of unemployed youth is estimated at 73 million this year. It is actually a slight improvement from 2021, but sti still 6 million above the pre-pandemic level of 2019. Young women are also worse off than young men with a much lower employment to population ratio. One form that has attracted the young workforce is gig and platform work, which is replacing traditional work for many. While there are fundamental issues relating to privacy, security, and the divide between rich and developing nations on digital platforms, which actually require global collaboration for, to be solved, the gig and platform economy have opened up new avenues to access the labor market. Technology is redefining economic, re uh, economic relationships between workers and clients or employers globally. The platforms restructure how work and work processes are actually organized. Now, if you look at this, investment in digital technologies and achieving universal broadband coverage by 2030 could actually lead to a net increase in employment of some 24 million new jobs worldwide, of which young people will take around 6.4 million. ILO's 2021 flagship report, which is entitled The Role of Digital Labor Platforms in Transforming the World of Work, highlighted how these platforms have given rise to benefits like flexible work arrangement, including for women, persons with disabilities and youth, but also created challenges for workers' well-being and working conditions, especially in middle and low-income countries. These challenges include missing out on the benefits of traditional workplaces which like, you know, the paid leave, uh, minimum wages, limited working hours, collective bargaining and social protection, as is now really on the owners uh, shifting from employers to the workers themselves. And additionally, workers struggle to actually find sufficient well-paying work in this uh, giving platform economy. Okay. I wish to cite an example where we in India uh, as ILO carried out a study with SCOPE, which is state-owned enterprises, on women in leadership positions in public sector units. And interestingly found that many women executives had cited the work from home arrangements as an influential factor in not only facilitating a better work-life balance, but also advancing their careers. Now, first Ladies and gentlemen, India has a large agricultural and also manufacturing industry and economy, which being energy and resource intensive calls for just transition to ensure the continuity of uh, the sector in a sustainable manner 
that is not degrading the environment. These two sectors can generate green jobs that limit greenhouse gas emissions, minimize waste and pollution, and improve energy and raw material efficiency, ultimately contributing to low material footprints and ecosystem restoration. Also here, we have the potential to create some 8.4 million jobs for young people by 2030 through the implementation of green and blue policy measures. Ladies and gentlemen, and one more important thing I wish to really bring to your attention is that the ILO constituents agreed that the critical component of a just transition is the practicing of occupational safety and health measures in every workplace, guided by international labor standards and tools to prevent disease, injury, and deaths arising from employment and work. A safe and healthy work environment is, is so central that the tripartite constituents of our 187 member states decided to shift, uplift really occupational safety and health to become part of fundamental principles and rights of work. Amending the declaration from 1998, which already referred to the elimination of child labor, the elimination of forced labor, and the elimination of discrimination, and the right to organizing and collective bargaining. Improving fundamental principles and rights at work include occupational safety and health, and doing so throughout the businesses and supply chains will have a positive impact on improved employee experience, productivity and quality of produce and services, improved worker health and safety, lower absentees and lower health costs, reduced impact on the environment, just to name a few of the benefits. Businesses face challenges like supply chain disruptions, revenue losses, liquidity crunches, reduced staff morale, and a shortage of labor through the pandemic. However, they have reported, as we have already heard, that COVID-19 mitigation measures really emphasize worker well-being. And we documented also this in a recent publication called Good Employee Relation Practices in Responding to the COVID-19 Pandemic and Lessons Learned in India. We did so in collaboration with two major employers organizations, the All India Organization of Employers and the Employers Federation of India. Servant member enterprises reported how they implemented measures to improve communication in order to maintain worker morale, keep workers informed, and facilitate business operations, all while addressing the pandemic's uncertainties through social dialogue. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you know that these are practices that don't only hold true during the pandemic, but also uh, in, in the kind of business environment that we are living and going to live in going forward. Companies and businesses like yours have a golden opportunity to shape the future of work with young men and women who are now entering the labor market by leveraging these different opportunities, demonstrating empathetic leadership, and investing in the youth. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, by building a culture of trust and involvement, businesses can nurtures a talent, which leads to enhancing the employee experience. The foremost way to achieve this is by engaging actively in social dialogue and collective bargaining. Work arrangements arrived at during the pandemic are leading examples of how employers and workers negotiated agreements, including on work from home and teleworking, which were mutually beneficial to both parties. This further helps achieve employee excellence as engaging and retaining the workforce through dif difficult phases helps to build resilience and ensure business continuity which fosters innovation going forward. India Inc. has survived the worst of the pandemic and looks towards adopting more sustainable systems that work in tandem for employers and workers. 
as the International Labour Organization, we are here to basically support you. I wish to all of you every success in realizing workplaces that establish cultures that are socially responsible, promote employee welfare, and support the sustainable development of this country. And I'm very happy and honored to be here with you today and really look forward to hear more on these important topics in the very interesting panels and discussions that we are going to have together during this day. Again, thank you very much and encourage you to continue and to share your good experiences with others. Thank you so much.